Joan Telzicunha will join us, as you can see, through, through Zoom. He couldn't attend due to um, familiar issues. And so, we, but we'll, he will be giving us uh, a lecture uh, through Zoom. Thank you very much um, for being able to present. Joan uh, Telzi we are uh, continuing with uh, Portuguese reality. Joan uh, Telzi Cunha comes from, uh, from Lisbon, from the Catholic University, and he will be uh, presenting us a paper entitled Breaking the Fabric, the Portuguese Trade of Indian Textiles in the Beginning of the 17th Century, which is kind of continuation of what we discussed uh, this morning. So thank you very much, João. You can uh, start whenever you want. Thank you so much for the introduction and also for the invitation. And I must thank uh, all the organizing committee, Angela, uh, Joanne, of course, and uh, Catherine, and uh, for uh, above all, for providing me a way of being with you. Um, uh, Indian textiles, it's one, it's one of my hobbies. And it's a hobby that I share with a, a, a friend uh, called Maria João Ferreira, who has done some uh, work with me. And um, it's not very, it's an area that it's not usually uh, researched in Portugal. Um, and I would like to say that one of the problems that we have still today is um, most of the time we don't know uh, when we are referring to a certain type of cloth that uh, appears in the documentation, how uh, that um, visually, how that cloth looks like. And if you have the patience to look at this painting, you will notice uh, a series of paint of, of um, textiles that uh, are were woven in, in, in India. But uh, we don't know uh, what was their name uh, actually. So, uh, this is one of the most uh, of the most uh, pressing problems that we face today, and w one which uh, we may uh, must uh, solve. But today, uh, my uh, my talk will uh, be uh, about uh, the shift uh, uh, that uh, existed in uh, uh, Indian textile trade in the beginning of the seventeenth century. And everything uh, began when I was doing my master's thesis um, some odd 20 years ago or more, when I found a, a, a charter that was issued in 1607 in Goa, where for the first time um, we have an uh, European power trying to impose uh, measurements for Indian textile production. Of course, we later know that uh, the Dutch and the uh, English did that in the late uh, 17th and uh, 18th century, but uh, we didn't know, we didn't knew that the Portuguese tried to do so uh, because uh, most of the time um, historians were too occupied in looking uh, not at uh, textiles but but at spices. So that is the, the the one of the problems that we have in this area. So uh, this royal charter that was issued in 1607 renewed an earlier one that was uh, published in 1601. And that um, put me into a, a, a new path of research in my thesis away from the spices and into textiles. And um, what is interesting to note is that uh, Textiles are not uh, uh, things that the crown uh, usually um, invests. So it's very seldom uh, we have uh, references in, in uh, the official uh, documentation, which is the most usual documentation that we have as uh, economic historians. So uh, we must save uh, through archives and libraries to try to uh, find um, what, uh, uh, what we can. But what is uh, interesting to note uh, and uh, to stress is that uh, despite the importance that traditionally people give to, uh, give, uh, give to spices, actually 
uh, most of the private investment uh, was done in textiles uh, from the middle uh, of the 16th century onwards, uh, along, of course, with um, precious stones and other uh, luxury commodities uh, that had uh, uh, a radical consumption in Portugal and also in the European markets. Of course, most of these private investors um, are um, either great uh, merchants, bankers, um, most of them are of new Christian uh, origin. Uh, for those who don't know what new Christian means, uh, uh, are the descendants of those who were forcibly, uh, forcibly uh, converted to uh, Catholicism when uh, the the Jews uh, were expelled from Portugal in uh, 1496, and so um, these are the main uh, the main investors. And along with those uh, investors, of course, we have also uh, a plethora of uh, uh, other uh, participants in this uh, uh, textile trade, namely crown officials and other Portuguese living uh, in Asia, and so. Uh, we, we can see that there is a, a somewhat um, similar uh, phenomenon occurring later in uh, Dutch and English uh, investments uh, in uh, Asian commodities. Uh, they started by investing in spices, mainly pepper, but by the late 17th century, the Dutch, but mostly the British, of the English at that time still, they were investing uh, in um, textiles and mainly uh, Indian cotton textiles. And that's the, the most important um, uh, uh, thing to say. But well, again, we can't uh, have an uh, accurate assessment of this uh, trade since it was mostly carried by private uh, individuals and not by the crown. So uh, most of the documentation, as I've said, is uh, issued by the crown that we have in the uh, in Portuguese archives and libraries. And uh, But we can have an insight on uh, uh, what was going on uh, through a multiplicity of documentation. Uh, which unfortunately, until the uh, until the eighteenth um, uh, century, we don't have a uh, complete series. We have only uh, some scattered uh, data, but we can uh, try to reconstruct, as I will try to do uh, uh, today, um, the uh, picture of what was going on. And uh, the vitality of this uh, kind of trade can be assessed by a, a variety of documents, namely complaints and petitions that were addressed to, to the Crown. And one of, of those petitions uh, that we know of uh, was made in 1610 by a widow called Maria de Oliveira, who was living in Vila do Conte, uh, which is a, a port city in the north of Portugal, near Porto. And uh, she asked to receive the commodities that uh, a dead husband had brought from uh, India. Uh, and most of those commodities were Indian cotton and silk textiles, mostly from the Deccan, from the Konkan and Sint. And there is a particular reference to a very unusual uh, luxury item, which is what uh, it is called pavilion, uh, pavilion in the in the document, which may be, uh, of course, a pavilion is a tent, but it may refer to wall hangings. And you have here uh, another uh, thing that uh, is sometimes very difficult to uh, assess what they were trying to. Uh, the real typology of, of the of the textile that the document is uh, trying to uh, describe. So, uh, once again, we must try to have uh, as much uh, uh, a variety of interpretations of what is a pavilion, uh, a tent, all hangings, uh, a cover that we because uh, we don't know, of course. And but um, besides these complaints and petitions, we have. Uh, another way to evaluate the overall uh, value we, um, of the of this uh, textile trade 
through the inquiries that were carried by the crown in the late uh, 16th and early 17th century to assess the loss uh, that the crown received with the exemptions and liberties that were given to official uh, to the officials and crew members in the Carrera de India. Uh, Carrera de India is the Indian run. Uh, it's the maritime line that uh, links uh, Portugal with uh, Asia. It's, uh, it uh, started in Lisbon and it ended in Goa. And um, uh, through these uh, liberties and exemptions, and also through the sale of rents connected with the ships coming from India, we can try to have uh, an idea of the uh, um, average amount of uh, textiles that were uh, traded uh, uh, in that time. We know that through one of those uh, inquiries uh, carried out in 1601, that uh, the Crown had lost at least 57, more than 57 million reis uh, in dues for the liberties and exemptions that were given to officials and sailors from the uh, six uh, ships coming from India in 1600. But most probably, this is an, an underestimate of its overall volume, value. Um, as we can see uh, in the sale of the freights and dues for individuals, uh, individual ships in the following years. In 1610, for, for instance, the dues and freights of the commodities shipped aboard uh, 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 a ship called Monte do Carmo were bidden by a well-known new Christian financier and merchant called Manuel Moreno de Chaves, who has investments in the Atlantic slave trade uh, among uh, other commercial ventures. And the interest here is the connection between uh, the trade that is carried uh, through the Carrera de India in textiles and the Atlantic slave trade. And I, as I was saying, Manuel Moreno de Chaves uh, be it the, that rent uh, for the total amount of 30 million range. And another uh, Lisbon merchant called Manuel de Paiva, this time an old Christian, that means uh, he was uh, uh, not of uh, uh, Jewish uh, descent, um, bid the freights and dues for another Indian ship for uh, the, the amount of 25 million reis. But both men knew that despite being acquired at the uh, sum, they will get their money back with the profit. So uh, this was, uh, this can give us a, 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 an insight of the real value of what was going on. There is a, a third, uh, kind of uh, documentation that can provide us um, with an idea of what was going on in terms of textile trade. And uh, that is when, the, as was uh, usual at the time, when, one sh when a ship shipwrecked, um, there was some or all, uh, most of the time, um, goods were salvaged uh, from the, the shipwreck and lists of those goods salvaged were uh, rec recorded. And so we have one of those uh, records, which was of the shipwreck of the ship, uh, Nossa Senhora de Luz, uh, who, who went down off the island of Fayal in Azores in 1615. Uh, and uh, it revealed the true breadth of the Indian textile trade carried aboard the ships of Carrera de India, as most of the cargo salvage and recorded by the local officials in Azores, uh, was merciful Indian textiles that were traded by people belonging to all social strata. Uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, something uh, absolutely uh, out of uh, what one would expect, giving, for instance, the royal uh, the the names uh, and, and typology of um, Indian textiles referred to in the royal charters of 1601 and 1607, which only refer to uh, four production centers: uh, Gujarat, 
with most, uh, with the, uh, more um, types of textiles than any other Indian uh, uh, textile production center, followed by the Khan near uh, in the vicinity of Goa with six types of textiles, uh, Coromandel Coast with three types of textiles and Sindh uh, in what is uh, today's Pakistan. Um, and Sindh is rather problematic because uh, you have the, ri the river Indus, which goes up to the Punjab, and that, man that means that it can probably include uh, the um, textile producing areas around Lahore and uh, further uh, where, uh, further east, sorry, in Agra. So um, with seven types of textiles, and uh, um, of course the problem is that you have more. Uh, um, textile producing centers in India, namely the ben ben Bangalore area, uh, which will be the main uh, place of uh, uh, in the 18th century. So, it, which is absent uh, strangely from uh, these uh, two royal shelters. Uh, but of course, um, one thing is less legislation, and the other is the, uh, the commercial reality. And the commercial reality uh, showed in, in the salvaged goods of 16, uh, 1615 show a larger geographical distribution of production in India, and far more types and names of cloth, either of uh, cotton, silk, of mix or mixed fibers, uh, than the uh, uh, earlier laws. Again, uh, if we lack uh, until the 18th century uh, series for the textile trade made uh, through Portuguese, uh, by the Portuguese to the Atlantic, we have some uh, quantitative insights regarding its value and the increase of its commerce since uh, 1500. Uh, at the half, uh, in, the uh, in the middle of the 16th century, uh, in uh, 1552, uh, a well-known uh, author called João Bredão de Boarcos estimated that the annual cargo of Indian textiles arriving in Lisbon has a net value of uh, uh, 14 million reais per ship. And given that at the time the average number of ships arriving in Lisbon from India was, an, was four, that amounted to... Uh, 15 to 6 million uh, range annually. So uh, by the middle of the uh, of the 16th century, that is the value which uh, you will have, uh, uh, the pattern that you will have to ascertain the reminder uh, of, uh, of the data that we have for later dates. Namely, uh, and though we have to uh, be uh, aware of the two facts. First, uh, in the second uh, half of the 16th century, um, there was a decrease in the number of ships that uh, were sent to, uh, to Asia uh, in, by the Carrera de India, but the tonnage of each ship uh, increased. Uh, and it was um, quite common by uh, around 1560, 1570, that the average tonnage of each ship was uh, 1,000 tons or more. Uh, there were uh, ships that were absolutely, uh, absolute monsters. Uh, um, for instance, when the, uh, the English captured one of the Indian men uh, in uh, the late 16th century, uh, called St. Catherine, Santa Catarina, and uh, took her uh, to the Thames to, to, to show it to the to, uh, to the lo Londoners, um, Londoners could not believe in their eyes uh, by the sheer size of the ship. So um, they were probably the biggest ships uh, afloat at the time. Uh, and if we we have um, uh, the average uh, or uh, value of uh, fourteen million reais uh, for each uh, ship in fifteen fifty two, in sixteen sixteen, for instance. Um, a single hull uh, carried textiles worthing uh, more than 
one hundred thousand, one hundred million range. So uh, more or less uh, in half a century, uh, you have seven times more the value of the cargo that was shipped, and of course more than that than, than the value also uh, the um, the amount of uh, uh, textile Indian textiles that were uh, sent uh, to Portugal. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, that is the problem that we must see is that textiles, despite uh, the value, the, the, uh, um, the total car cargo value, uh, uh, um, only amounted to about 15% of the overall cargo. Most of it was uh, still uh, made of pepper and other spices. Uh, but of course, when it arrived in Lisbon and was sold, uh, its value was higher than that of the uh, uh, spices that were sold. And so Indian textiles and other Asian textiles together with diamonds and, and Indigo amounted uh, in the beginning of the of the seventeenth uh, century to about ninety two percent of the total uh, cargo value that was uh, sold at Lisbon. Uh, but of course, uh, here we have a problem that this trade is too dependent on the performance of the Correio de India, and uh, its efficiency was declining since the second half of the sixteenth uh, century. And uh, we have a, a, a paradox that uh, Indian textiles uh, and its trade is partly to blame to its downturn, uh, of course, with other causes. But um, the uh, Indian textiles, uh, as you can imagine, as any textile, is rather bulky. Uh, and so the bundles of textiles were uh, cluttering um, the lower and upper decks of the ships. They were making the life very difficult when um, the ship wanted to maneuver. Uh, and we have cases uh, that uh, when there are uh, southern wind gusts, um, the ship was so unbalanced with the textiles cluttering uh, the decks that some of the ships uh, turned and sank. So uh, uh, textiles, uh, paradoxically, uh, uh, caused uh, a decline in, in the efficiency, uh, in the uh, operational efficiency of the career of the India. And, uh, um, and we have many writings, uh, especially for the late uh, 16th century and for the beginning of the 17th century, uh, among which we find the writings of a well-known uh, uh, new Christian called Duarte Gomes Solis, uh, who, re who published uh, two books, one in 1622 and the other in 1630, where he, he associates clearly uh, um, the way that the, 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 car the cargo is put aboard uh, these ships and their, um, ev their eventual sinking. And they uh, fight for uh, to reform the way that the cargo was put uh, on board, but uh, to no avail because uh, the crews uh, wanted these uh, these liberties and exemptions uh, to make money, and uh, of course, uh, though the crews uh, had no money uh, to um, buy uh, items in India. Uh, to um, for their liberties and exemptions, they sold them uh, to whoever they they could find, and um, it was this um, uh, social pressure that the crew members uh, exerted, exerted. Sorry, um, as in the case of uh, a petition addressed in 1604 by the crews of three galleons. Uh, who wanted to have a larger space uh, than the small chambers at the bow that they were given for their liberties. 
and uh, they ask for more and better places at, st at the stern of the ship. And um, the officer that was uh, that dis distributed uh, the, the alerted the, the place, uh, the space aboard the ships, uh, recognized, and it is important, uh, 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 and this is a quotation, that these sailors have no other profit than the merchandise they bring in their cab in their cabins, and the galleons have no more space to spare. And so uh, it was between this uh, this reality that uh, uh, we are seeing that the, the uh, operational efficiency of the Correa de India uh, was declining. Uh, if you look at this uh, uh, table. Uh, you will see uh, the evolution of the number of ships that was sent to Asia and the number of ships that returned to Portugal. Uh, the most important, of course, it's uh, the amount of ships returning for, to Portugal. And um, you see that the number of ships per year is declining since the second uh, uh, half of the 16th century. And when it arrives, in uh, after um, 1620, you have an average of one ship per year arriving at Lisbon, at best. Of course, uh, after the the in the second half of the 17th century, sometimes you have no ships arriving into Lisbon, uh, and so um, which means that uh, the operational efficiency uh, uh, as uh, um, uh, impact on the economic uh, exploration of Carrera de India. And so this, uh, together with the um, numbers of, of the revenues what, which were taken by uh, the, the ships of the Carrera de India, and again, we, can, uh, we have no complete series, we have only a few years, uh, we can see that uh, the numbers of uh, the profits, the revenue, sorry, that were uh, that the crown was getting, was decreasing uh, already uh, in the late uh, 16th century, and uh, though it uh, more or less stabilized uh, in the first two decades of the 17th century, but uh, after 1620. Uh, the decline was uh, notorious because you have uh, uh, a total amount of revenues uh, uh, around um, 250 million uh, reais uh, to uh, uh, more, more or less a quarter of that value uh, less than 10 years later in the, uh, 1627. So you see, uh, um, the crisis was uh, uh, already uh, uh, striking uh, the, um, commercially this this uh, uh, this world of Carrera de India turning around in textiles, uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, besides of course this uh, uh, inefficient operational draining of the Carrera de India, uh, you have a, a problem. Uh, that the crown tried um, since 1550 uh, um, to uh, rent its exploration to uh, private investors. It managed to do so, um, but uh, those private investors started uh, 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 disinvesting, so to say, in uh, Correa de India, um, already at the end of the 16th century, and uh, around 1614, 1615, that inefficient operational running uh, meant that all the most profitable uh, uh, segments of uh, this operation were being deserted by private investors, uh, uh, and one of the last to uh, to desert. That this investment was uh, a man called George Rodrigues Solis, also a new Christian, who was highly involved in the Atlantic slave trade. And of course, that meant that Portuguese uh, investments were turning from the Indian Ocean 
to the Atlantic. Uh, and, and that is uh, something uh, important and to have uh, in mind. Uh, but of course, there were also uh, other, um, other aspects that were uh, running uh, badly, uh, namely on the procurement in India. Um, the, there was no uh, sizable uh, production of textiles in any area controlled by the Portuguese, so they depended largely in what they could get, uh, especially in Gujarat. Um, and, of course, uh, the demand uh, grew by the Portuguese, and the, it was elastic uh, as the way that the Indians managed to answer to that uh, uh, to that uh, uh, increased demand, uh, but of course um, the Portuguese never really controlled the the production, which was entirely in uh, dependent in uh, uh, Indian hands. Uh, the system is, is well known; it's a kind of Verlag system. Uh, so I won't uh, be uh, uh, going uh, because. Uh, due to the time, uh, only to say that uh, it was um, extremely uh, fragile, uh, especially in cases of uh, war, um, famine, uh, plagues, and the production could be, uh, uh, could suffer, as in 1630-32, uh, when uh, drought followed by uh, bad harvest, a plague of locusts and other plagues meant that uh, thousands of uh, weavers died in India and the quality and quantity of uh, their production declined for the next 25 years. So, uh, again, uh, we don't have that much uh, knowledge on the uh, um, uh, procurement circuits in India. Uh, Though we know uh, that, of course, they, those who invested in, in textiles uh, had two main circuits. One was in Gujarat, and that circuit in Gujarat was associated with indigo. But, uh, and of course, most of, the, of these investors were new Christians. New Christians uh, invested in a global scale and when their family members in america started investing in cheaper uh, and easier to access uh, guatemalan indigo uh, they stopped uh, buying um, indian indigo by the by 1615 uh, we have no more uh, record of a sizable uh, quantity of indigo being sent to portugal and of course the other uh, commercial secret uh, was the Deccan, where it was associated with the diamond mines of Golconda, as the, the cloth was a way to conceal the stones and smuggle them either to Goa and later to Lisbon. So what we have is by, uh, after 1615, there is a decrease in the uh, uh, private investment uh, uh, in Indian textiles, um, and money is being diverted to the, to, to the Atlantic, and the Portuguese are increasingly dependent on Indians, especially on uh, the Goan Sarasvat Brahmins, to have access uh, and to acquire uh, textiles in India, and they are going to dominate uh, the supply side of the question uh, until the uh, late 18th century. Uh, of course, the problem is that uh, the other investors are small investors where we have a, a very small uh, commercial or economic nexus. Most of the of these uh, uh, of the textiles they be, uh, they buy is uh, to send to, to relatives in Portugal or to uh, their brethren like the Jesuits, uh, and the Augustinians, and other religious orders. And so uh, it's not a real economic uh, uh, enterprise. It's more, uh, it has more um, to do with, uh, um, with either sending gifts to the family or uh, to uh, religious orders 
or uh, religious institutions. Uh, and I, I refer here one of the case of a, a woman called Maria de Faria, uh, who uh, received uh, in 1615 uh, um, liturgical accessories uh, for uh, the church of São Cristóvão uh, near Vila do Conte. So uh, is that exactly to say that the impos um, how it is impossible uh, the, that these petty investors replace uh, the large investors that were the, the new Christians. Of course, uh, the other problem is that uh, there is still the crown, of course. Uh, uh, the crown, the, it invested mainly uh, in, 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 uh, in uh, textiles for, its, for trading in uh, the Indian Ocean and uh, for consumption in Europe. Uh, it's a, a part that I will figure given the, the time uh, that I have left. Uh, but if the crisis felt on the transportation and the procurement side uh, ended by affecting uh, the relatively successful distribution of Indian textiles in Europe. Um, the Portugal played an important role in distributing uh, Indian textiles uh, in Europe after 1500. Its real contribution was the creation of new markets, uh, either in Africa in, and in America. And it, it was connected with slave trade um, because there was a problem in Portugal. Uh, income, never, uh, uh, Portuguese income, average income never allowed to the development of uh, mass consumption uh, in textiles until the late 18th century. And so, uh, unlike what happened in, in uh, the Netherlands and in England, where you have a mass consumption of textiles by the end of the 17th century, uh, Portugal was quite late uh, in arriving at that stage, uh, given, given it, it hadn't uh, uh, a level of income uh, suffice to uh, um, entering into mass consumption. And so uh, besides having no uh, mass consumption, it had a no marked merchant fleet uh, to compete uh, with other distributors, uh, especially in Northern Europe. And uh, Northern Europe uh, traditionally uh, stopped the uh, exportation of uh, Indian textiles or another Asian textiles to their uh, to, to their market to protect uh, uh, their textile industry. So the problem uh, was partly solved by the Portuguese by uh, trying to develop a new market in the South Atlantic. That market in South Atlantic was a, a breath of fresh air that allowed for the growth of uh, ship Indian textiles, either uh, block printed or weaved. Uh, and I, I, I refer, of course, uh, to, uh, text, uh, to cloth called uh, Ledrilles that was uh, printed in uh, Gujarat for the Mozambican uh, market and other uh, cloth that is called uh, Guinea uh, Pintados. Pintados is a kind of shins. Of course, it's black, block printed. That was sold in the, uh, around the Gulf of Guinea in the 16th, 17th, and early 18th century. So, but most of these uh, investors are new Christians who uh, also have interest in the uh, uh, African slave trade. Uh, uh, for Brazil, but also to Spanish America. Uh, things were beginning to unravel badly for the Portuguese side around 1615-30, uh, when the accumulation of declining numbers of ships and investments in the Correio de India impacted negatively in the procurement in Asia and in the distribution in the Atlantic, especially when other Europeans succeeded in all three parts of the operation, procurement, transport, and distribution. Furthermore, 
social and religious pressure also impacted negatively in the Portuguese main investors in the trade of Indian textiles, the new Christians, who suffered a further backlash with the restoration of Portugal's self-rule in 1640, which meant that the closure of the Spanish-American market for them. After 1640-50, Portugal pioneering rule in creating new markets for Indian textiles in the Atlantic had given place to a niche presence in the South Atlantic, where it subsided until the 19th century, either as wholesale com commerce connected with slave trade or as luxury investment traffic to send to relatives or to religious institutions in Portugal. And if the Dutch and the English had demoted them to a secondary role after 1640-50, Portuguese home merchants and ship owners faced Brazilian competition for the same markets after 1790. Uh, thank you so much for your um, uh, attention. Should I Joana? Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm just going to stand here so that uh, João can see me, I believe. Um, so thank you very much for for the for your paper. It was quite quite deep, and it uh, kind of continued what we started discussing today about the Portuguese Portuguese um, profile in the international uh, textile trade. Um, so uh, João can hear us very well. So does anyone have a, a question or a comment? Angela, yes. Maybe you can uh, yeah, okay. stand here so that it can. The microphone is right? Yeah. Hi, thank you for your uh, talk, quite interesting, a lot of information. Um, I have two questions. Um, early in your talk, you spoke about uh, cargo where people of all social uh, strata would have commodities on. Could you elaborate on that? Um, does it really mean that different people like, um, were connected in the trade, although uh, they were probably like, yeah, anyway, if you could say a few more words on that. The second one is, um, you talked about, I mean, then quite a large volume of, of trade. Um, where did they find the producers? Uh, were there staple markets where they would actually purchase the goods? Or um, yeah, how do, would they actually get to the commodity that they brought um, to Portugal? You can answer. Well, uh, thank you. For, okay. Uh, thank you for the, um, the, two, uh, uh, the two questions. Um, I, I will try to, to uh, be brief in, in uh, my answers. Uh, first, yes, we, we know that um, all social strata was involved in, in this kind of trade uh, because of the names that appeared in the, um, in the record uh, that was made in uh, Fayal in uh, 1615. Um, uh, we know, for instance, uh, that uh, one of the names involved was a judge of the High Court called uh, Don Vicente Nogueira, who was also uh, um, a clergyman. And uh, among the, the many things that, that he had uh, was a cassock for himself and um, uh, two bundles, two large bundles of uh, cassa. Uh, which is a very um, uh, fine kind, uh, Indian cotton. Uh, so it, it was luxury. It was a, a, obviously a luxury item. Uh, we have the names of. Uh, well, I can. Uh, quite long. Um, I don't know. Uh, um, the documents are are, are uh, in this. Can you um, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, in this, uh, um, in this, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yes. Uh, um, are kept in this, uh, uh, in this volume. Uh, and you have, um, and you can follow the, the, uh, the social, uh, uh, belonging of the, of the people that, that were there. Uh, namely the fact that you have even, um, a Jesuit that sends uh, in Goa that sends the um, uh, goods for uh, for his sister with a nun in a convent uh, 
I think in uh, either Lisbon or Stubal, uh, you have the case of um, a, a, man, a, a new Christian uh, um, financier uh, and great merchant called uh, Luis Fernandes, who lives in Brazil and has an, a, a, an enormous amount of, uh, of goods. And when they are recovered, um, they are put into large crates of, uh, to, to, um, to, uh, to send them to, to Lisbon. And, and, and of course, by following the names, uh, you see that they belong to all, stra uh, to all social strata. Um, uh, it, it's, it's one of the, uh, the reasons uh, I can say that. The second uh, is uh, a very interesting question for which I don't have a, a, a very definitive answer because once again, um, we have um, on the supply side on, 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 on by Indians, we have either what appears in um, official uh, documentation, which says that um, you have this and this and, and this uh, uh, Indian merchant that came to, uh, to Goa uh, selling uh, textiles. Um, and sometimes you are lucky enough to have uh, the dues received uh, and you can more or less try to uh, make the total amount of the the value of the taxes that entered Goa, uh, but uh, for the uh, how the procurement was made uh, in um, in India, you have uh, very little details. Um, the best I could find was not in Portuguese documentation, but in the documentation uh, from uh, the East India Company. Uh, who uh, faced um, their presence uh, and uh, competition for the same products in the same uh, markets um, for where they go. You have um, annual fairs that are uh, made in certain uh, Indian uh, um, towns where the production is sold by the man who has uh, contracted the production to uh, a number of weavers that uh, live around that city. And so it's only through uh, non-Portuguese documentation that we have uh, some detail of how that, uh, um, of how that, uh, that those acquisitions are made. Uh, for instance, uh, in the 17th century, I have more, uh, some more uh, details for the 18th century because I, I was lucky enough to uh, find the, um, the commercial journal of uh, a, a, a Frenchman that was employed by a Portuguese uh, stock company uh, in the middle of the 18th century uh, and, that, uh, po and that Frenchman kept a, a business uh, journal and so uh, I could I, I was lucky enough to find how he did he manage to go uh, or to send uh, agents to this and that city uh, in order to buy tax sales but uh, it's uh, one document uh, in uh, uh, 100 years so you see the difficulty we have Thank you, Jean. I, do you want to follow up some of them? Okay. Um, are there more questions? Yes, Luis? Here? Do you hear me, Jean? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Jean, Luis Freire from here. Uh, I want to, to ask you about the uses of these textiles in, Pol in Portuguese culture. I'm wondering about the uses of Chinese textiles, for example, in the vestments of the, 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 the churches, the liturgical uses. And uh, what do you think about this type of uh, cultural appropriation or transformation of these textiles in, in our uh, uh, culture in Portugal? Thank you. <laughs> 